O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. His glory is above all. May grace and peace be multiplied unto you through Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> it was interesting this morning to observe how you do church and to hear from you as well, not just be standing here and speaking to you. It occurs to me that if perchance one Sunday morning the men's adult teacher would take sick, the discussion would flow, keep on going. Good job, Nathaniel. Wasn't so difficult, was it? I think I'll tell Brother Jonas King that I was delighted to see two of his nephews in action this morning, <clears throat> leading out in various ways. See what time is it now? Quarter till 10, 11, quarter till 12. So back home, Paul Stolswitz is probably preaching, getting toward the last quarter of his message. We're one hour further ahead, east. <clears throat> we start at 10 o'clock, we go till 12 and beyond. <clears throat> if we're all there and there's no visitors, which is seldom the case, we have 88 people, I think. 20 households. Yes, we consistently have non-members attending on a Sunday morning. I have for the last seven years. Almost seven years. <clears throat> Some are making moves toward membership and others are not. They're just receiving with us and we want to bless them, each one. It was interesting to me as we opened, who was it, Logan opened it, Philippians 4. That's exactly our Sunday school text back home today. Philippians 4, 10 to 20, or 23, went to the end. And Sunday school, we opened up to Matthew 6, and we've commenced on a new thing as a team, a minister team. We started a team series on the Sermon on the Mount. And Tim came up with a nice outline, about 20, 22 messages, I think, from the Sermon on the Mount. We just started. Paul this morning is the fourth one, so each one of us had one turn. <clears throat> Tim Weaver sends his greetings to you, Omar. And Leonard's not here, so I'll just pass it on to Tristan. I plan to see Tim Weaver tomorrow afternoon, Lord willing, at Calvary Bible School. They plan to be there for a board meeting and help with the cleanup. <clears throat> okay, let me attempt to do something I haven't done recently. Oh, and as far as children's class, uh, you had your Sunday school this morning. I just have one more lesson, I think. So we'll save that till this evening. But a reward for each one who will say this by heart without my help. Blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear, with the reference, Matthew 13, 16. That's what Jesus said. So let's leave a breed of right eyesight, full commentation, like how binder lies in, lay freedom. So we have to go to sleep in freedom's mid eye sign. Grease that I won't try and undermit them, highly hen, kusses, grease, I highly, highly hen. The Gnade uns des Herrn Jesu Christi, and the Liebe Gottes, and the Gemeinschaft des Heiligen Geistes. Simonai, Allen, Amen. How many have any clue of what I said? Oh, yeah. Those that have Amish background? As far as I know, in Amish country, USA, all, all around, wherever there is an Amish service this morning, that will be recited at the conclusion. So I invite you to turn to the English version of that. Where's that? Last four verses in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 13, 11 to 14. Actually a beautiful passage. <clears throat> I don't know if we always realize what was being said, but we were reminding ourselves of a, a very suitable mission statement. This is our calling as a church. It was for the Corinthians. It is for Cornerstone Mennonite. It is for... Finn Castle Mennonite. <clears throat> 11 to 14 in 
in 2 Corinthians. Most of my ref- references this morning will be from Corinthians or nearby. I don't know if I have any from the Old Testament this, this morning. <clears throat> Does anybody have the Amplified Bible with them? No? That's fine. I didn't bring mine along. So like I said, this is a good mission statement for any church, any brotherhood. I really think it is. And we need to remind ourselves of this. I see six mandates. I see four promises at the end of this. <clears throat> this is God's will for, this was God's will for them. It's God's will for us today. So let's start with the word brethren. Finally, brethren. Sulechlibi brethren. I think I counted 35 times in the two Corinthians letters where these believers are called brethren. Even though they used to be adulterers, they used to be homosexuals, they used to be thieves, they used to be drunkards, all kinds of bad things in 1 Corinthians 6. This group that had now been changed, been cleansed, been sanctified, They're called brethren. Brothers in Christ. For a few samples of that. 1 Corinthians 1.10. You can keep that up there for now. That's, That's great for everybody to see that. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I beseech you, brethren. Chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech. He starts a number of chapters like that. 10. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. Brethren. And he's speaking of them. These Corinthians. These (laughs) Corinthians that had issues. There's a lot of trouble things to work with in the book of Corinthians. This was a church that had problems. Uh, Maybe we can identify. But he says, we be brethren. And I encourage that. And by the way, I didn't want to forget to encourage all of you. I am blessed by things I see here. It seems like everybody's attentive, except the little babies, and that's okay. And Tony's done a tremendous job in just shooting those verses up on the board and Harnessing me up without, without much problem. And just want to bless you for your welcome. And but as far as this brethren, I encourage us to maintain this concept and terminology. It's okay in your WhatsApp message just to say, if, if it's the one person, Brother Omer, Brother Chad, or Brother whatever, Brother. When you think of that man in the church as a brother, it does something to the way you relate to him, I think so. We be brothers. So let's look at mandate number one. Finally, brethren, farewell. I'm not sure why the King James uses farewell. I mean, it's at the end of the book, and he's almost done writing to them. But really... The other versions, I think all the other versions, German says, Freiheit. What's that mean? Rejoice. Spanish says, Tened gozo, have joy. Other versions that you might have probably say something about rejoicing, right? Instead of farewell. But actually, I looked this up, this word farewell, in the new, in the Greek. And I think it's 5463. You can check me out. 5463. And that same one is for rejoice as it's used in 32 passages in the New Testament. Which means be cheerful, be calm, happy, well off. Three times in 2 Corinthians 7, the writer says, I rejoice, I rejoice. He practiced what he's calling them to hear. Finally, brethren, rejoice. Tened goso, have joy. Do we need that reminder? Shouldn't it be automatic to be rejoicing? Because the sun is shining and 
All of us have more than we need, I learned in Sunday school. And automatic rejoicing, right? But really, I think you've learned with me that to rejoice is a choice. Yeah, that's a rhyme. To rejoice is a choice. It doesn't depend so much on how much you have. It doesn't depend on the perfect setting, the perfect environment. Sun came up this morning. I'm healthy. I'm not coughing. I get to go to church. Automatic rejoicing. We still need to make a decision. We're going to rejoice. You could think of count your many troubles, name them one by one, but it says count your blessings name one by one. Rejoice. Philippians 4, early on, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Do you know that chorus? Rejoice in the Lord always, again I say rejoice. I appreciate singing congregations. Why don't we try something here? Let's do the first three rows. That's number one. From there on back, fourth row and back, number two. Front two, three rows, number three. And then number four is all the rest. There's four parts to that little chorus. You know how what I mean? Start here, rejoice, 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 rejoice. And then all those flow together. You've done that before? I think it'll work. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord Rejoice in the Lord and I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice, rejoice. And again I say rejoice. Finally, brethren, rejoice. That's biblical. Thank you. You did well. Number two point here says be perfect. Be perfect. So let's leave you read a Friday side. Vollkommen. Complete. Do you sometimes at council meeting say or other times that I'm not perfect? That's a given, right? I'm not perfect. As if to justify all the struggles I'm dealing with. I'm not perfect. I wonder what you said when you came through Sunday school, Matthew 5, the last verse. Didn't Jesus say, be ye therefore perfect, as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. What did you say on that? Did you just say what it does not mean, or did you say what it means? Maybe this is review then. You know, often in the Bible, it, it actually is quite often it calls us to perfection. I think in the Greek it's 5046 means complete in various applications of growth and labor. But in this verse, and some others, it's 2675, katatizo, katatizo, complete thoroughly to repair or adjust, fit, frame, mend, join together, prepare, restore. Same way as in 1 Corinthians 1.10, which I started reading this morning as a sample of uh, brethren, using the word brethren. 
Let me turn to that again. 1 Corinthians 1.10. It says that you all speak the same thing. There be no divisions among you that ye be perfectly joined together. Let's be perfect. Same entry as that. So could you pull up Matthew 4.21. I'm looking at a, some samples now, verses where this same 2675 in the Greek is used with another English word, which I think will help to bring us understanding of what it means to be perfect. To be perfect. So this Jesus is walking and calling his disciples and while I read this, you try to figure out which word in there could have anything to do with being perfect. And going on from thence, he saw two brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother in a ship with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Which word could it be? Perfecting their nets. Perfecting their nets. Did they have to tie them up or thread or knit? or I don't know what they did, but they were perfecting their nets. You check me out on this. I think it has 2675, same word as the word perfect here. Galatians 6, one. There it is. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in the fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. What word could it be? Restore, perfect such an one in the spirit of meekness. So if somebody has a fault, you acknowledge that, don't you? I have my faults. Brethren, if a man be over, oh, if you're overtaken in a fault, ye that are spiritual, doesn't say ye that are completely without faults, restore. You help to perfect that person. We'll skip over them. Romans 1. Let's go to Hebrews 10.5. 10.5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but the word prepared is there. And Hebrews 11.3. Hmm. There, through faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which were seen were not made of things which do appear. Any clue here? Worlds were perfected by the word of God. Framed, made perfect, brought together. I don't know if that sheds any further light on what it means to be perfected, but I think it helps me. And I, I might give a f few illustrations, but I think of being perfect, that's a state of being. It's We can be perfect in Christ. Be perfect in Christ. Yet being perfected. Being perfect, yet being perfected. So I'm thinking of some little perfect ones. Is Colin Rohr, is he perfect? Is he perfect? Everything's there? No, everything's there. But you hope he grows up. You hope he grows up in the next few years. Yeah. Ariel King, is she perfect? Perfectly shaped and yet being perfected. In a year, she'll be able to do things that not doing yet. Our one and only grandson had his first birthday yesterday. It's perfect. We called him. Video of wonders of what you can do with technology on my wife's phone. Video call. And so he recognized our voice, I think, and he, he was reaching for us, but he didn't quite understand what all this means. He's not walking yet. He's not really talking clearly yet. Perfect yet being perfected, you know. Maybe that helps us to understand. God looks on us as perfect in Christ, perfect if our hearts are like we heard in Sunday school, single, single, focused, full of light. Yet how loving and patient he must be, he's still working on me. 
Anybody have an orchard here? Okay, you, you know you know what an orchard is, whether it's apples or oranges or if it's a vineyard with grapes. When they start in the spring developing, they just start growing. They're still hard and green, but perfect, yet being perfected. And you wait to pluck them, harvest them till they're completely formed. Finally, brethren, be perfect. Number three, be of good comfort. Do you see that? 2 Corinthians 13, 11. I should keep a marker in there. So, Be perfect, be of good comfort. Trace today. Amplified says, be encouraged and consoled and comforted. Almost the first words of First Corinthians. Do you perchance have that First Corinthians 1, 3? Maybe not. I'll read a few verses here that have the word comfort in it. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father. 1, 3. And from the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. What am I doing wrong here? No, it's Second Corinthians 1. Numbers mean so much. Critically important. That Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them with which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation... That's comfort. Also aboundeth in Christ. Whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And so on. Comfort, comfort, comfort. We get it from God. We pass it on to others. We serve a God of all comfort. Jesus was a comforter when he was here. He ministered to the hurting. Didn't the first verse that was on here, Isaiah 61, the Spirit of God is upon me. I'm anointed to preach the gospel to the those who need it, <laughs> those who are broken. He was a comforter. Then the disciples were sad when Jesus announced he's going home, he's going back to the Father. What? We're going to be left alone here? But he said, it's good. I have a plan in place. When I leave, the comforter is going to come in my stead. And he can be with you wherever you are. Even if you 12 disciples are scattered to the four, all, all the parts of the world, the comforter will be with you. Second Corinthians. I'm trying to stay close here if you want to follow along. But I'm primarily sticking with the letters of Corinthians with any additional parallel thoughts. 2 Corinthians 2, 7, so that contrarywise you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wouldn't that be sad if somebody had sorrow and they'd be swallowed up overmuch, they'd become discouraged and lose out. That would be sad. We need to learn to comfort, and that's often through the avenue of forgiving. It doesn't bring a lot of comfort if you can't forgive somebody for that person or for yourself. <clears throat> and Second Corinthians 7, 9. Now I rejoice that ye were made sorrow, sorry, but that I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance for you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Now, all this works toward comfort. <coughs> From sorrow to repentance to forgiveness to comfort. You know, there's a lot of reasons for sorrow, aren't there? There's sin, of course. But things bring us heartache when there's 
troubles and stresses and splits and so on and sadness. But you know, ultimately all comfort comes from God and we must receive it. And then be fellow comforters. 1 Corinthians 14, 3. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. That's an edifying speaker or a prophet. 31. 31. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. Comforted. And Paul's testimony in 2 Corinthians 7, 4 is... Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I'm exceed, exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Without were fightings. Within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. You know, we ought to be fellow comforters, and I'm hoping that my being here is at least partly comforting to you all. It might be a blessing to sing a song once in a while. Let's sing 322 verse 1. Everything's out of the hymns of the church. 322 verse 1. This is good news, good news. Spread the tidings all around. Oh, spread the tidings. Amen. The comforter has come. He lives with you, right? So you can be a fellow comforter. Come ye dis disconsolate wherever ye languish. Come to the mercy seat. Fervently kneel. Here bring your wounded hearts. Here tell your anguish. Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. Verse 2. Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot cure. Verse 3. Earth has no sorrow but heaven can remove. Yeah, we have sorrows to deal with. Sure we do. But we can be comforted and smile again and experience rain, rainbows. Finally, brethren, be of good comfort. That was point number three. Now number four. What's next on the list here? Finally, brethren, be of one mind. Be of one mind. Amplified, be of same agreeable mind. You might recall that these Corinthians had problems with divisions, schisms, contentions, party spirit. Shame on them. Shame on us. 1 Corinthians Paul was so sad what was happening there. I beseech you, brethren. I did read that. I beseech you, brethren. But he said, well, read it again. I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no division. Didn't say less divisions. No divisions among you. But that you be perfectly joined together 
perfectly joined together. That's part of perfection. To, in the same mind, same judgment, for it has been declared unto me that there's some of the house of Chloe, there are contentions there. Some say I am of Paul, some say I am of Apollos, some of Cephas, some of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And he says a lot about this, really, throughout the book. Have you heard of these kind of things? I don't want to embarrass anybody here. In the last 50 years, has the Mennonite church heard about these kind of things? Experienced these kind of things? I don't like to talk about it. I don't like to think about it. I don't like to hear stories about it. Church splits and divisions, these things ought not so to be. And yet it's reality. Do we succumb and say there's nothing we can do about it? Well, it's true in the sense we can't undo history. History is history. And my callers like to remind me that you know, the history of the Christians is horrendous, full of warfare. They know the story about the Crusaders. They know that. And we just have to acknowledge, yeah, that's part of our history. It's not a good part. That wasn't the right thing to do. They weren't following Christ in doing that. 1 Corinthians 12, 25. There, the illustration of the body here says that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another, whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. If one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Amplified, so there be no division or discord or adaptation. You know, verse 6, I think, is an example of being a one mind. So somebody has a loss in their home, somebody died in their home, we can weep with them. If somebody had a great success, some great victory, some cause for rejoicing, rejoice with them. That's part of being of the same mind. That's the way it should be in the body. You know what God's favorite number is? <laughs> Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The number one is so frequently in Scripture. And I was toying the idea of uh, speaking from the Lord's Prayer. Do you know where the Lord's Prayer is? John 17. That's the Lord's Prayer. The one in Matthew 6 is the disciples prayer. He taught his disciples to pray that. Our Father which art in heaven, we we're supposed to ask for forgiveness for our sins. But what did the Lord pray when he was here? And that's such a beautiful prayer. In John 17, I might just refer to part of that. Connect that with, with uh, the question, what's God's favorite number? Neither pray I for these alone, but for them which shall believe, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I and them, and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me, hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Does Harrison notice what's going on in the churches? Does the community of the world around us, wherever we're at, notice what's going on? Does the way we live as a church affect their idea of what the gospel might be like? Lord, forgive us for the dark testimony that's been too frequently. But we don't throw up our hands in despair. Like I said, we can't undo the past. But we can resolve in our hearts and we can, from this time forward, be unity builders. We can practice what we're reading here in 2 Corinthians and these other passages about being one, having the same mind. Am I minded to be one or am I quick to glorify diversity? 
we're all different the way it is. Sure enough, Finn Castle Mennonite is made up of members that are all different, but we're one. One. Such a blessing. Such a blessing. Do we know that song, Bind Us Together? Let's, let's sing that. We do that every time we have communion. That's one of our unique traditions. We stand around the circle and hold hands and sing this. Bind. That was a little prayer request. You think the Lord heard that? You think he could answer that? I think he could. I'm glad to see how you're working together. We could read many verses that speak of either one mind or same mind. A few samples. I don't know. I don't recall what I all gave you. Did I give you Romans 15:6? says that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians, have you? No, that wasn't part of your Sunday school. But in Philippians, it speaks of oneness. We're going through Philippians in our Sunday school study, and there's some clues for oneness here. Only let your com conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ that whether I come and see you or else be absent I may hear of your affairs that you stand together fast in one spirit one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel and so on maybe some of this will save till the peace part same mind really same mind but I don't think like you because of my background or the influences that I have <clears throat> but we can be of the same mind in Christ. 12, 16 in Romans, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. So whenever there's callings like this that seem almost impossible, is it practical? Is it possible at Cornerstone? Or Fincastle, they have all this diversity here. They now come from many different communities. They come from Georgia. They come from Tennessee. Most of us come from Faith Mission initially, and we had a binding core group there. And now we blend in these others. Can we now be of the same mind? Yes, it is possible. And I appreciate when we study the scriptures and we read the scriptures and we read something like, be perfect, be of one mind, Instead of saying, no, it can't mean that, it can't mean that, that we work together to figure out what it does mean. Trust you're doing that. So finally, brother, be of one mind, one mind. Live in unity. Point number five. 2 Corinthians 13. Finally, brethren, live in in peace live in peace last sunday brother tim was doing his first one in the series on the sermon on the mountain and was on five nine blessed are the peacemakers peacemakers great i wish i would have brought some of the notes along but you know it's more than a way of thinking 
It's more than a way of talking. It's a way of living. Live in peace. Live in peace. So live as to promote peace. Be peaceable. Be easily entreated. These Corinthians had some enemies of peace. They did. The chapter before here, verse 20 says, For I fear lest when I come I shall not find you such as I would that I be found unto you such as ye would not, lest there be debates. It's an enemy of peace. Envies, strifes, wraths, backbitings, whispering, swelling, tumults. <laughs> Those aren't peacemakers. There's things we need to avoid to be peacemakers. So a peace doesn't mean that er there's no conflict. <laughs> it's the right way to enter the conflict and resolve and bring together it really is do we have a god of peace yes a god of peace we serve a god of peace it says so in verse 11 and the god of love and peace shall be with you the god of love and peace you could look at romans 15:33 it says the god of peace be with you all romans 16:20 mentions the god of peace Philippians 4, 9, the God of peace is mentioned. And what I don't have memorized, I'm curious enough to, what does it say in 1 Corinthians 5, 23? And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus. The very God of peace. Muhammad's not the God of peace. Neither is Buddha or any other strange gods. They're not peace gods. Our God is a God of peace. And Hebrews 13, 20, now the God of peace. That brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect. The God of peace. To know peace is to know, to know God is to know peace, right? You've seen that in Holmes County or some places. Know God, know peace. Or, if you want to spell it this way, if you don't have a God, if you're an atheist, you're a skeptic, you're an unbeliever, there is no peace unto the wicked. The ungodly. No God, no peace. Two ways. Peace comes from God. So if the God of peace gives to us the peace of God, should we not live in peace? <laughs> yes, we should live in peace. We could look at many verses in in uh, First Corinthians or Second, but I'm going to make it a goal not to go too much past 11:30. I didn't even ask what quitting time is. But I assume lunch is not far away, and that's usually what we say at home if it goes past 12. Lunch is not far away. and you know, Even if it went late, uh, everybody still does. Oh, one of the delights here is I see lingering fellowship after the service. That's a good thing, whether it's evening or whenever. Lingering fellowship. Not everybody's just zip out the door. Okay, I gave myself a reason to go as long as I, the Lord wants me to. We're called to be at peace among yourselves. We're called to follow peace with all men. Do you ever remember reading that in Hebrews 12? Seek peace and ensue it. You read that in 1 Peter 1, 3, 11. As much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Romans 12. Are you giving it all you've got to live peaceably with all men? It, that takes some sacrifice, but... That's what it says, as much as lieth in you. In contrast to all the fighting that's going on in the world, it's not just in Israel, not just in Ukraine. There's fightings going on throughout the world. And there's another kind of fighting that's going on in churches. So sad. Lord, make us instruments of peace. Instruments of peace. Let's turn to number 118 and sing verse 5 and 6.
And if you'd like a change of position and stand, you're welcome to do that. I'm standing, you're welcome to stand. And you're, you have such comfortable chairs. This, this is a prayer. The whole song is a prayer. And it's a plea for peace, I, I think so. But notice especially the words in verse 5 and 6 as we sing it. Drop the... Take from our souls the strain and sweat our Lord, life's confess the beauty of the Breathe through. I'm one of those that thinks if the all men's written there, it should be sung. If we mean what we say, it should be said. I noticed the word cool here. We use the word cool quite a bit in our way of talking, don't we? Oh, that's cool, that's cool. This is a little different, I think. Thy coolness. You, you ponder that a bit. What does this mean in this context? Thy coolness and thy balm. We're talking about living in peace. Finally, brethren, live in peace. That was number five. Number six, where's another mandate? Verse 12. Greet one another with an holy kiss. First Corinthians at the very end also mentions that. These Corinthians were to greet one another with a holy kiss. These ex-thieves, ex-homos, ex-drunkards were called to this. To this, really? Oh, well, that's just a little verse. Well, it's just five times in the Bible. And who am I to say that this and that teaching in the New Testament is important and this is not? This is a salvation issue and this is not. Don't let me say that, Lord. Don't let me say that. If it's in the Word of God, then it's important. Dare we argue with God? Is this any less important than any other mandate? I grew up in the Amish church, but in our setting, we actually practiced this from the day we were baptized. And it's been a blessing to me for the last, let's see, that was 70, 53 years. It was such a blessing to me when the old men reached down and greeted me and shook my hand. They greeted me this way. It's been a tradition of mine all through the journey. And we emphasize it in our church today. The 16-year-olds practice this, at least at home. So I just ask, do we, do we argue with God on this point, or do we enjoy the blessing of this? Do we need revival in this, or don't we? I, I've noticed some losing out in various churches that I've visited, and I just wonder why. Is it really because of COVID or anything else? Is it? <clears throat> in a context of brotherhood where there is unity and peace, where there is love and we're living as brethren, shouldn't it be spiritually spontaneous to do this? It really should be. And I'm not here to expound much on that, when, where, always. But I think for sure, at least in church, when it's us as brothers together, sisters together, Even in this day when it might be more and more unpopular, this is meant to be taught and practiced. Finally, brethren, greet one another with an holy kiss and be blessed thereby. Verse 13, all the saints salute you. Paul was, maybe you're not big on salutations. Paul was. 
Did you ever read Romans 16, the list of names? Greetings from Phoebe, greetings from Johnny, and greetings from Alex, whatever the names are there. Greetings from this church and that church. You know, some cultures are more that way. Ukraine, they, they send greetings. And there's some Ukrainian families that have moved to the U.S., and I noticed that. Victor Mosul, they live in North Carolina, and reach, recently one of his sons came to our house, good friends with our son, who was in the Ukraine for five years. And the word came, greetings from dad to you. Or they'll exchange greetings as churches. I think that's a good thing. To continue to greet one another and bless one another, encourage one another. It just warms my heart when somebody thought of me. And we should practice the golden rule. Bless God for all the saints. I think there's still more than 7,000 who have not bowed the knee. Let's look at the fourfold promise now as we're nearing toward the end here. Verse 11b, the promise is the God of love and peace shall be with you. Be with you. Isn't that a blessing? As we fulfill these six mandates, this God who is loving, this God who is peaceable, this God who is gracious, this God who loves to communicate will be with us. He will be with us. And I think if we live these six points faithfully, he will be with us. And if the triune God be with us, we will live in peace. We will rejoice. We will all these other things. Works both ways. Do you see the Trinity here? Do you believe in the Trinity? Well, you need to read Romans 8 if you don't. <laughs> How can you ever separate the three parts there? But here, even in verse 14, I see all three. The grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost. Is the Trinity a problem to you? Or a blessing? Or a solution? <laughs> you know, in Jesus' prayer, he said, as the Father's in me and I'm in the Father, do you think there's any dissension in the Trinity? Do you think the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost ever have arguments? Or vie for position? I'm number one. You're number two. I'm almighty. You're mighty. Remember where you stay. No, they're perfect unified. I think so. So it blesses me to think about how the triune God is unified. And I don't think we need to worry that we give one or the other too much credit. You're not going to over-exalt Jesus like too many of my callers are concerned about. They want to make sure, especially the Muslims, you know. God is almighty. Jesus is the prophet. Have to make sure we understand that there's a difference here. What a blessing when we un understand the triune God in part. We can receive his grace, his love, experience communion with him. The grace of Jesus, the love of God, communion of the Holy Ghost. You know what communion means? Fellowship, communication, common union. So I think we'll have closing song yet, number 88. The triune God is mentioned here, and it's beautiful. Really it is. 88. Does the song leader have a pitch pipe? Oh, I might get it too low or too high if I try to start it.
Amen. The triune God is with us as we continue from here. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. If you'd like to stand for prayer, I'd invite you to do that. Thank you, Lord, for your presence with us all the time. You promised that. You've been faithful in that. We've been the unfaithful ones. We've shifted from time to time. So forgive us. Thank you for these clear words from your word that tell us how we ought to live as brethren, how we ought to relate to one another. Thank you that we can have fellowship with you. We heard some deep things in our Sunday school, and we tried to understand what's here said in 2 Corinthians 13. Help us now to be doers of the word. Lay up treasures in heaven. Have a single eye. We might live peaceably. We might be of one mind. We might make no excuses for any sin. And may we be a testimony to the community around us. May our oneness help to win them to the one triune God, to the one Savior. Ask your special blessing on this group here at Cornerstone. They may continue to prosper in a godly way and you would direct their way forward. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.